Hello my soccer universe. This was probably the craziest day of watching a tournament that I can remember yesterday. I call it Monday Madness. Uh, it was even made crazier that I was so tired that for the halftime of the France-Switzerland game I actually went to sleep. I had the presence of mind to record that one. I mean I said okay Switzerland is one ahead, so um, it could be interesting. And I recorded the rest of the match. And yeah, I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning and watched it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Was it now my day per se? No, because uh, both uh, matches I actually wanted to go the other way if you look at my dream draw. And I think especially the Swiss are my ultimate bracket busters. The Czechs I expected. The Swiss, where did that come from? However, I'm wearing Switzerland because like yesterday, uh, with, with the Czechs it worked out so perfectly that uh, I have only one Swiss jersey and I now probably have to work on that one. now. But that uh, the spot here behind the chair was the Swiss jersey, so yeah, the spot is empty, and I decided to put the Swiss jersey on because they fully, fully deserved it. Such a performance against France, uh, the way they came back, also the Croatians, the way those two teams came back, <coughs> Croatians just couldn't pull it off uh, in the end. But yeah, uh, also the crazy thing, so many goals scored. I mean, we had eight in one, six in the other, both teams going, both games going to overtime, both games having the exact same storyline with the outsider going ahead, two defensive blunders. Uh, the, the favorite coming back, looking, cruising with about 10 minutes to go. And then the last 10, 10 minutes, the outsider forcing overtime. Uh, no, no, I mean, it was almost too much to take. And you, you actually think after the Spain game that there's no way that the France-Switzerland game can live up to that. Um, and, you know, I leave it up to you. I think both, I, I cannot decide which one was, was the better team. I think the sublime quality of the French goals maybe puts it slightly above, but the overall drama and um, human payoff at the end for Spain... Uh, it was something else. I mean, that, it, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Uh, it was even so crazy that when you see my summaries that I have for the match, uh, that for the France game, I had to squeeze it all together because it would have been too much. So I could even finish to get the penalty show in there. But let's start in Copenhagen. Uh, and I was thinking, uh, Copenhagen probably had the most drama of the entire Euro so far. I mean, every match there had a storyline. A big storyline. Um, Bucharest also, but Copenhagen, I think, was the heart of. I said it before. The, the emotional heart of is the of the Euros is Denmark. I meant actually the team, but in many ways, Copenhagen. Yeah, Croatian fans out there, all over the place. Um, but the match, which, as I said, I think is pro will probably my least favorite jersey matchup. Uh, probably down to uh, mostly down to Croatia. Also, as we'll talk about in another uh, video. But I think it started out with how you would expect with Spain going forward, having chances. I mean, Koke missed already a pretty big one early on. The goal for Croatia came out of nowhere. Uh, Pedri making a back pass that Una Simon cannot control and it goes into his own net. Uh, one of those absolutely nuts ones. And I loved, I mean, I was listening to the Totally Football show. I love the explanation uh, behind it because it is uh, funny and probably true to some degree as well that um, not only do we have the most tired players ever at a big tour tournament given how condensed the schedules were, but we also have the most talented players ever. So you have a Pedri who plays a back pass. See, I can put a back spin on it because this will make it easier for the goalkeeper to step up and the goalkeeper saying, yeah, hey, I see your back pass, uh, but I'm way too tired to pick it up and so we got an own goal. It's hilarious. It's ab ab absolutely hilarious. Ninth own goal at this tournament. Um, I also heard an argument on the Totally Football Show and I actually agree with that too. Yes, there are many, uh, the tiredness and all plays into it. 
However, uh, own goals are now accounted for differently than they have been a few year, years ago. And the prime example was, I think, one Wayne Rooney goal against Switzerland. That was the uh, same thing what Slovakia scored against Poland, where actually the goalkeeper made the own goal because it was the last one to touch. But that one was credited to Rooney and the other one was credited to Jesny. So uh, we are much stricter now in accounting for own goals than we have been before. So the comparison is a little bit unfair. Um, I also think that we should make forced own goals. I mean, this here was a true own goal. Forced own goals, uh, which is kind of, you know, um, you had no other chance because back there there would have been a striker that would have pulled, pulled it in. I think uh, we should make that distinction in addition. So yeah, uh, it's a little bit uh, murky, but you know, nice that. And then with that goal, suddenly Croatia had the upper hand and I actually thought they were trying to push for a second, but then uh, Spain could control it back a little bit and before halftime, Sarabia, who had been already outstanding against Slovakia, scored uh, at the equalizer. Second half, uh, while Croatia tried to press high and everything, um, Spain's quality shone through. And they get the equalizer through a really nicely played goal. Uh, it was in the end, yes, Aspilicueta who scores his first one for Spain. 2-1, and at that moment I thought, yeah, it's really not going into Spain's uh, way. Even more interestingly, there was this water break, and right out of the water break, uh, Paul Torres plays a long ball to Ferran Torres. Croatia completely caught off guard. Ferran Torres makes it 3-1. Yeah, that's the game, isn't it? That's the game. However, and it really, for a long time, it didn't look like it. But then suddenly, Orsic, who came on uh, together with Pasalic, suddenly the game changed a little bit. And there was another argument made. It was really hot. And given the tired players, bringing a fresh player on just gives you that much more, especially in, uh, in such an intense game, gives you just on that position that much more advantage. And that's exactly what happened because uh, Orzic completely overran uh, whatever Spain were, 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 were doing. Him coming, I think uh, he came over uh, the right, I think, yeah, against Gaia, completely uh, outplayed there. And then, uh, Yes, the, it, it was a little bit of melee when he pulled it he, he pulled in. The Modric was uh, very, very much there, but it's only 85th is 2-3 Croatia. Yeah, we have a game and I'm looking at my wife and, and so, you know, uh, it's not that I haven't spent, but I actually really would like Croatia to win this one uh, or get, get something. And, and then we're looking at each other. They're going to make another goal. And then my kids come, 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 come down and say, yeah, the, oh, oh, the, the, so, so, so many goals are, are scored, my old, older one says. And then we both said, yeah, and I think Croatia is going to score another one. And a few minutes later, Arsic plays the ball to Pajalic, who puts it into the net. 3-3. Three, three. Absolute madness. Then right at the beginning of all time, really Croatia, we have Spain where we want them, although Spain came out good. But then Unai Simon made an, a monster save completely making up for his blunder in the 20th. I think it was in the fifth minute of overtime. And then the big payoff, uh, Dani Olmo, who also came, came on and who had actually played his uh, lots of years in Zagreb, plays a ball to Morata, who just slams it home. And I have to say, despite me being more on the Croatian side for, 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 for this one, um, it felt good to see Morata score such an important goal. And then uh, Oyasabal adds a second and game, set, match. In that sense, Croatia could not come back from that absolute crazy game. And so moving on to the France game. At the beginning, yeah, it was not that, I mean, France uh, for five minutes played a little bit. Uh, but then Switzerland found the rhythm in a way, but I didn't find it now a super exciting game. However, the goal through Seferovic, I mean, uh, for, for, for Pavard really needs to uh, put more pressure on Zuba before May making cross and then Langley. Uh, what is he doing? Seferovic just stands and can have, have a free hand headed to make it 1 0. And also, what were the French attackers doing? I mean, there was not much happening there, to be honest. Uh, I think the best one was a pass uh, through the box from uh, Rabio and a, a long range shot from Rabio. There was nothing else happening. And I think the Swiss actually deserved their 1 0 lead. They could have even made it, made it 2 0. I, I mean, I have to condense it now a little bit. Um, there was a clear foul in the box, the referee didn't see it. However, VAR steps in, gives a penalty. Ricardo Rodriguez, who's a very safe penalty shooter, uh, 
Actually, I think the penalty was, was not that bad, but, but it was uh, not perfectly placed. However, uh, he's not, I mean, have, him having played for Formula million, I've seen him three, three videos of the Swiss national team. He's not, uh, he's usually not putting it in, in, in the core corner because you usually can fool the keeper. But uh, Joris is there, saves the penalty. And suddenly, Frost got the upper hand. And the next two goals that Balsama scored are some of the finest that you will ever see at the tournament. Mbappé plays a horrible pass, but Bozema with his trailing leg controls it, pulling forward and puts it over Soma in, into the net. I mean, I was looking at this goal uh, this morning and said, what? How did that happen? And then France really has had the up and said, okay, let's kill off that game. And again, from Mbappé, the ball comes to Griezmann, who wants to lob Soma. However, Soma gets a hand, a, 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 a body part on it, maybe the hand even. Uh, and it lobs towards the line, and there's Bonsema heading it in. 2 1 for Frost. Um, and at that moment, no one gave a dime uh, the Swiss to come, to come back. And then uh, Pogba, probably the best goal of the evening, just takes the ball outside and nonchalantly puts it into the corner. What a great goal! 3 1 for Frost, and I was thinking, yeah. Uh, France didn't play great. Uh, they just did a little bit here, a little bit there. 3-1 lead. This is the strength of France. However, that's exactly it. this uh, non-committed uh, and nonchalant way of playing. Suddenly they turned off and Salam Babawa plays a ball in for Seferovic. It's 3-2. Then uh, just a couple of minutes later, Gavranovic thought he had already e e but it was a, uh, really a marginal offside. And you think, oh, this is all that the Swiss have? No. Schalke plays a ball to Garanovic and it is 3-3, it goes to overtime. I think that comeback in many ways was even crazier because if you think about it, if the Swiss convert the penalty, France is in true trouble. Yes, it is not beyond them. They maybe could go to turn around, but they were also this offside goal. There was the chances for Switzerland to win it in regulation and they fought themselves back. And I actually... I think Switzerland pulled in a sol pulled in a really solid performance. They did so against well against Italy. They were ab abhorrent, and I think against Turkey they didn't want needed needed to do it done. They put a really solid performance and fought it, dug in, fought out, and fought as much as they could. They are not as talented as France, but they really gave it their all. However, France didn't do that, and that's why the game went to overtime. Overtime, not much happening. The game went to penalties. And again, Pogba's penalty, I don't think you can see a better penalty ever. Show me one that was ever taken better. I mean, uh, he takes his time, picks the corner, bam, in. However, all the other penalties are also really well taken. I think it was Vargas' penalty where Joris had a hand on there. And for Marcus Thuram, who is actually Jan Sommer's teammate at Gladbach, uh, Sommer was in the corner, but there was all went safe and then the base steps up and I think he shoots it high, but maybe should have aimed a little a little bit higher and Jan Sommer saves and Switzerland is through and I don't want to say that Switzerland was the better team because we clearly could see that the French are the better team. However, the French thought this will be a cakewalk and woke up too little and then let it slide again and then honestly yes there were a few scenes where i thought what what is he doing uh i know that um Bonsema was injured when he had to come come off but griezmann that was one yes he was run, running but i thought you're taking really a lot of strength out there then uh the big change i mean he started with three or three back which was not not a good thing then he takes long lay off and it's kind of then a uh, 4 3 3 4 4 2 kind of hybrid thing with Kingsley Command coming, who made a lot of noise. Then Kingsley Command come, come, comes off uh, also with an injury to Ram come, comes off. So I thought there were a few signs that things are not well in the French camp. The only thing is when uh, Bosama came on, off, and Giroud came on, I actually liked the interaction. What I didn't like at the end is then no one came to Mbappe, who went straight to the locker room. No one came there to console him or whatever, which kind of speaks a little bit for the lack of team spirit in the French camp, maybe, potentially. So yeah, I gave it, I tried to con two absolutely crazy, crazy games. It's exhausting and I, I'm glad I slept in between because taking it all in, in advance, that would have been probably too much. 
the bracket now. As I said, Swiss bracket busters. Uh, we'll see the special in the expected one, but let's stay with this one. In St. Petersburg, with Switzerland against Spain. There is some history. I remember quarterfinal in 94 the World Cup at the 2010 World Cup. Of course, Switzerland beating Spain in their opener. Um, in both games, Spain was playing in red. I think Switzerland might play in red this time around, so we have to see. But, you know, there's a little bit of history between those two. Uh, Spain should win this one. However, I'm not sure that this is happening with uh, the way Spain is leaking on the back. But again, Spain, I mean, uh, first they don't score and now they have scored 10. <laughs> I just don't get it. But the goal average is now at 2.7. We were always at 2.3. Now it's really, really where a uh, goal average should be. So yeah, uh, and the winner will then play, of course, the winner of Belgium against Italy. But we see already Belgium-Italy is the big matchup in the quarters. And the rest is, there's usually a favorite and an outsider, no matter how today's games are going. As for projected, I mean, with France out, Spain is now, yeah, clearer path into the semi-final. I actually have to say with that also the path for Italy becomes a whole lot clearer in many ways. Portugal out, which I think is an opponent they don't like. France out, opponent, opponent that they don't like. So yeah, also, um, you know, I haven't mentioned it, but France and Croatia out. That's the World Cup final, out yesterday. Yeah. Uh, and we know that Sweden against England uh, and we have a Belgium-England final at the moment, which is, I think, the first final that I predicted. And I also said that England's going to win it, but yeah. Overall chances, you see it already if you know how I arrange my jerseys. With France out, Italy now can leapfrog Denmark because their path to the semi-final, uh, to, uh, to, to the final got easier because you don't have to play France. So... Um, that became definitely easier for them. Uh, however, Belgium is still uh, the favorite. So we have one v two more or less. Whoever wins that, that one is almost favored to win it. Uh, but that's because England and Germany and Sweden and Ukraine have not played yet. Spain at the moment in fourth. But I would say that the winner of England Germany probably could potentially even leapfrog Belgium. Uh, I have a feeling like that. Speaking of England Germany, yeah, that's the big one in the afternoon. I think Sweden-Ukraine will be for many an afterthought. Um, it might turn out to be a good game, so uh, let's see. I am egg about England-Germany is the fixture that I think everyone in a way has been really looking forward to, despite Belgium-Portugal. England-Germany, yep. Um, however, I see already that where a game is played also has a big influence and London has not had the greatest game so far despite a spirited Austrian performance. So yeah, let's see how it will go there. Let me know how you uh, <laughs> survived yesterday's uh, evening. It was crazy. I don't think this can be topped. I don't think this can, can, can be topped. I think the Euros might have peaked. The Euros so far were really entertaining and good. They might have peaked right here. Um, let's see. Maybe there's another uh, surprise in store, but it might as well that it has peaked with yesterday. I, I cannot see how this can be um, topped. In any case, give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like these. Uh, and yeah, I will be talking to you soon. Bye. Hey, just in case you enjoyed this video, here are some videos and playlists that you actually might enjoy too. Also, please consider following me on social media and actually subscribe to my channel so that you stay updated with everything that happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.